I said last week that I, I just wanted to comment just for a moment about Romans chapter 4. Then we're going to immediately go into Romans chapter 7. Then I had told you that we would go to Romans chapter 9. And this is the, the neat part of not being kind of tied to any class material particularly. I forgot all about Romans 8.28. That all things work together for our good. I totally forgot about that until last week. So next Sunday, we'll look at Romans chapter 8 verse 28. Uh, easily the most misused verse in all of Romans. One of the most misused verses in all of the New Testament. How Does, does everything happen for a purpose? Does everything happen for a reason? We'll look at Romans chapter 8 verse 28. 28. Make some comments about that next time. Okay, Romans chapter 4. The whole discussion was a discussion on the faith of Abraham justifying him versus the works of Abraham justifying him. Which was the correct answer? Did his faith or did his works justify him? Both did. The point that Romans 4 made was that Abraham was justified by his faith. The point of James chapter 2 was that Abraham was justified by his works. And James dealt with more of the discussion because it was in the context of what James wanted to prove. With all of us, faith works together with our works. So faith works together with our works. And now we come down to the point of just this, this quick little discussion. Are you a Jew or a Gentile? Because in Romans chapter 4, the Jew was someone who had the law. And, and how did they feel because they had the law? They, they felt really good. They felt very... Spiritual, they felt very led by God. They felt definitely that they were God's chosen people. But Paul said what? You're just as bad off because you don't what? You don't do it. You don't do it. So you have it, and you, you feel good about that fact, but you don't do it. So the Gentile is learning. That they can be justified by faith. But as they are justified by faith. Just like Abraham. Who is in Romans chapter 4 verse 16. And I love this description of, of Abraham. Right up to me. Next to him being called the friend of God. In James 2.23. Is the description of Abraham in Romans 4 verse 16. He is the father of us all. So the Gentile learns that in order for Abraham to... To stand worthy as the father of us all. What did Abraham have to do? He had to work. He had to have faith in God. But he had to what? He had to prove it. How hard? Just for a, just for a sec. I keep telling you guys. This is going to be really quick. And stuff just keeps popping into my mind. How hard was it for Abraham to prove it? He had to be willing to sacrifice his own son. You know David was willing, I think we made the point last week, that David was willing to pay for the, the threshing floor of Aronah, which Aronah was willing to donate so that a sacrifice could be made and stop the plague. But do you remember what great principle that David said in the end of 2 Samuel 24? He said, I will not sacrifice to God something that costs me nothing. And so, it's a really good question. Are you a Jew or are you a Gentile? Are you someone who is really happy with yourself? Because every Sunday morning, you're, you're here. Every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, you're, you're here. But what are you doing? Because the Gentiles learned the fact of having simple faith and then doing. The Jews were just kind of willing to, to rest on the laurels of them being God's people. But that just wasn't enough. So we, we all know, we all discuss, we all understand just how important it is for us to be here because that, that is, and, and I think 
I, I mean, I, I'll, I'm willing to admit maybe, maybe I don't do the best job in communicating it, but this is an integral part of, of what we are, of our relationship to God, is being here. But it's not everything. And obviously, just like most of the week passes by without us being here, most of what we do probably ought to follow the exact same way. So don't just be a person who's a churchgoer and think that you're good as a churchgoer, but yet all of the rest of the time, you're not someone who's given to good works. Because that's the way that we ought to be. And that was the lesson that the Gentile was learning in the discussion. It was harder for the Jew because they had so much background. But it's the same lesson. And it's the same type of idea that we need to learn. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7 is a good discussion. Why is Romans 7 a good discussion? Why is Romans 7 a good discussion? Some, for some, th- I, it's, it, it's in a Bible class called Tough Text. So number one, you can, just, you can just understand that it's not an easy text to understand. I've even had, I've even sat down with, with you know, my, my peers, not my preaching peers, but with people who are just as old as I am, in, in Bible studies before, I think I met with someone who was, and we met at IHOP one time, and somehow we got to talking about Romans chapter 7. And this person was making all of these comments on Romans chapter 7, but he was completely wrong. And so we sat there and I explained to him Romans chapter 7 just like we're about ready to go through it. And it was like a total light bulb went off in his brain. And he just kind of, kind of completely reoriented his understanding of being a Christian because he had a different understanding of Romans chapter 7. So it's like Charles said, it's not easy to understand and it's easy to kind of get stuck in the weeds with it. There's a lot of people who feel that I can just keep on living in sin because of, of what Romans chapter 7 says. We're going to discuss a, a lot of the context of it. But just as we get started, someone read for us please Romans seven fourteen through 23. Now we'll get to the point where we're just talking about those verses. But let's start there. Romans seven. 14 through 23. Was that all of them? Oh. Yep, 23. Okay, good. One more little point. One more little point. We, and, and again, I, I feel like I need to say this. We look for Bible versions that are accurate, 
because we understand, we accept the fact that when we interpret the Bible, we want something accurate. But the Greek language, again, I want to have a lesson on, probably two lessons on Bible versions. But the Greek language is completely the opposite of the English language. We have, um, we have subject and then we have verb. They reverse that. So when you're reading in these more literal type versions, American Standard, New American Standard, King James, New King James, ESV now, uh, this really, really new version called the Legacy Standard Bible, LSB, very, very hyper accurate. It's going to read really, really strange. When you take Romans 7 and you put it in the King James Version and you stand in front of a crowd, I defy you to read it correctly. Because it's, it's throwing in not only a reversal of how we know the English, but it's adding 500 years, 500 year old language in it. If you can read through it without a mistake in front of a group of people, you're a better person than I am. So let's start pulling apart what Romans chapter 7 means. So the end of Romans chapter 6, what did Paul say? What did Paul say at the end of Romans chapter 6? Okay, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift is what? It's now eternal life. Again, it's going to be found in Christ Jesus. We cross over into chapter 7. And he immediately... We use Romans chapter 7 all the time to show what point. Well, that that is true. What point do we get out of Romans chapter 7? About marriage. And the point that there's a... Specifically, there's a difference between... We can marry... And divorce at, at will. There is a bigger divine principle at work though. All of the time. And what is that bigger divine principle than just civil marrying and divorcing? The words in Romans 7, 2 and 3. What larger concept is there? Yes, the, the idea of binding and unbinding. So bound, unbound. So the, the marrying and divorcing, you know, civilly down here on the earth, that's mankind's prerogative. We can do it correctly, we can do it incorrectly. But the binding, who does that? Whatsoever God has put together, joined together, bound together, let no man separate. So anyway, most of the time that, that preachers are referencing Romans 7, 1 through 4, that's what they're referencing. But it's only an illustration for what greater principle. And, and Teresa now mentioned it, for what greater principle? The law. We're dead to the law. So just like a, you've got a couple and one of them passes, they're no longer what? They're no longer under the law. So we had an old law. That old law, it died. It died. So we're no longer what? We're no longer under it. You know, Paul is trying to express just how, just how good and gracious it is to live under New Testament law. And so we, we get to the point now, if you go back to the beginning of Romans chapter 7, just kind of making some comments as we, as we move along through it, you get to verse 4, My brethren, you have become dead to the law. Because you have, through, because you have essentially, if you'll let me kind of fill in, for one reason, you've become married to Christ. I mean, you have obeyed Jesus Christ. But the, but the second reason... And I don't know that I could say the more important reason. But the second reason is the old law is dead. So now we're married to Christ. And you, uh, you, that you may be married to another, to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For now in verse 5, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. 
So far as what we've read through, what does the old law do for us? So far as just what we've read through, what does the old law do for us? The, the, you know, the old law, the Old Testament had several, had, had several oh, reasons for existing. In Romans chapter 7, one reason for existing was that it did what for us? And this was also in Romans chapter 6. You could even make the case that it brought up in Romans chapter 2. What did the old law do for the Israelite? It explained to them what sin was. So you started to find out this is what God wants you to do. For example, in, in what you ate and what you didn't eat. So when you ate something that you shouldn't have eaten, you had done what? You had sinned against God, so you had to you had to offer a sacrifice, and it's in this res- it's in this respect in verse five the sinful passions which were aroused by the law. The law told us not to do something, but there's always that part of us that what that that wants to do it. Um, so in verse six, we're delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by. So that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the letter. In verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? So we talk about the fact that it's old, the fact that it has died, the fact that it's been done away. But was it without use? Of course not. Was the law sin? On the contrary, I wouldn't have known sin except the law told me. I would have not known covetousness unless the law said you shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. This is a figure. This is a, a literary technique called personification, and it's done because it makes such an effective point. So, so sin is personified. In Paul's writings here, and it's just all through the Bible, sin is made into a what? Into a person. I I told you before about movies. Movies are all kind of basically uh, on the three-act play. Your introduction, your conflict, your resolution. Movies go along that thing. But movies also have good guys and bad guys, also known as. The good guy is the protagonist, the bad guy is the antagonist. Paul takes sin and, and in this writing he makes him an antagonist and it's just a, it's a really, really effective way to write things so that you never forget it. So sin takes opportunity by the commandment and produced in me all manner of evil desires. So, so what is sin doing? Say, saying another way in verse 8. What is sin doing? So the law is coming along and saying, don't covet. We've already talked about that illustration. Don't covet. What is sin doing? Sin is saying that covetousness is actually what? It's good, it's, it's, it's fun, it's a way to put purpose in your life. Just keep wanting to have what someone else wants. That's the way, that's the way to fulfill your life. Um, but in verse 9, I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. This is the classic what? I just saw a, I, I just saw a Reddit thread on this earlier in the week. No, I don't use Reddit to research Romans chapter 7. I was looking up something else. Romans chapter 7 verse 9 is the what? Classic passage on the age of accountability. The age of accountability. That's what, that's what a couple of people were just raging about on, on Reddit is, well, what is the age of accountability? 
My point was, no one ever gave an age of accountability, at least not in, every, in any sermon that I've ever sat in. And all of you guys who are, you know, we've got a lot of collective years of being Christians here along with multiple gospel preachers in the audience. I don't know of any individuals who's ever stood in front of another crowd and gave you the hard and fast age of accountability. I certainly never have, and if I did, I'm sorry, I was wrong to do it. But there is a point in every young person's life where what happens? What happens within them? Sin becomes alive in them. Now what does that mean? Because they can lie. You know, I've told you this before. They can lie really young. What age will they? Did you do that? No, I didn't do that. When do they start that? I don't know. What, <laughs> when do they start talking? Two years old, they can lie to you, but they don't what? They don't know it's wrong then. So when do they learn that it's wrong? At what age? I don't know. That's not my point to stand up here and tell you. However, I will tell you, there is an age when they begin to learn exactly what lying is and why it's wrong, along with everything else. Namely, at that, at that point in their life, just being disobedient to their parents. That's the age of what? That's the age of accountability. It's not the point that people can rage and say, well, what is that age? I, didn't, I never said that. I, I never gave you a number on that. But I just know that's the process that happens in every young person's heart. Because Paul is saying, I was alive without the law once. I didn't need it because I didn't what? I didn't do anything wrong. But once I did... Then sin revived in me and it, 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 as it were, it killed me. He says that I died. Now, of course, there's, there's, we're getting to the point. And the commandment, which does what? Which should have brought life, in verse 10, I found that it brought death. Because I what? Because I couldn't do it. Because I broke it. In verse 11, for sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it killed me. See that person, see that antagonistic spirit, that antagonism? So sin took this commandment and by it, it did what? Killed me. Oh, here's this law. You want to follow this law. But let me, let me show you this over here. Let me show you this covetousness over here. Paul's like, oh, I want to be covetous. Boom. The antagonist just killed me. It, it, again, an extremely effective way to, to paint this. Very, very hard to forget. Therefore, the law is actually what? Is holy. And the commandment is holy and just and good. But, we get to our reading. And I can't what? We get to our reading now. And now I can't what? I want so hard. To what? I want to follow it so badly. But I just what? I just can't. And this was, I was talking about uh, the, these figures. that I, They're phrases. But in, in, in our reading, for example, if you look in verse 15, the last part of verse 15, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. What I hate, that I what? That I do. From a little kid, I've been taught, you shouldn't covet. It's part of the what? Ten Commandments. You shouldn't covet. So I grow up learning. You don't covet. I get old enough, what's the first thing I do? I want to covet. Verse 19. Man, this is a tongue twister in the King James Version. In, in verse 19... For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. What's Paul saying? Now, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but what? Sin that dwells in me. Okay, so... We've got to stop about this. We've got to stop and talk about this. Because it almost kind of sort of makes it sound like what? Now I can put the blame on the who. 
on, on my antagonist. I can, I can literally say, because when you're in grade school and when you've got to go to the principal's office and you've got to answer for what you've done, the cardinal rule of all kids is you've got to blame it on somebody else. Without question, that's your only hope. That's the only way you get out of it. So what does Paul do? Or what's he try to do? He kind of almost makes it sound like in verse 20, if I do what I will not to do, it's no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. Does that give me a way out? Why? Because every person's sin is their own sin. It's their own decision to make. It's their own decision to make. So however, however colorfully Paul puts it in verse 20, I can't seize on that, that phrasing there and say, oh, I really don't have any responsibility for what I do. I actually do need to take that responsibility. Then in 21, I find then a law that evil's present in me, the one who wills to do good, for I delight in the law of God. According to the inward man, I can read it, I can look at it, and what conclusion do I come about? Come to it? As I look through this law, it's an old law, it's been displaced. The, I, told a, I told a young man just recently that the Jews enumerated, the Jewish rabbis enumerated just over 600-ish laws in it. Uh, that's probably right, uh, even though I haven't, I haven't done that kind of study myself. But just over 600 laws. You look at it, you come to the conclusion, all of those laws are great. You look at what to eat without the ability to process food and store food. Wisdom in it, all kinds of... It just keeps society and civilization running as a whole. I mean, it's just great. Paul says, I step back, I look at that old law, and it's what? It's good. It's good. I just can't what? I just can't follow it. In verse 23, I see another law, what? Warring in my members. Now they're fighting with one another. The antagonist and the protagonist. And I have this law fighting in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So you, you reach this point where the struggle is so bad. He's trying to wonder, what's the way out? And for all of you guys who aren't going to be here next week, what's the answer in verse 24? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ for two reasons. First of all, and we'll make comments about this next week, there is something to the power of Christ. There is something to giving your life and following Jesus Christ. That no matter what your sin is, no matter how deep your addiction is, no matter how much brokenness you experience because of your family or because of how you grew up, there is something to the power of Jesus Christ. And then we're going to add to that the power of grace. And when you put those two together, the grace of God and the power of Jesus Christ, you have this unstoppable force that can keep people righteous where the old law could not. And that's what we'll get into more next week.